Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if everybody could just move in just a little bit, we want to have a really great discussion here, and I know it can be a little difficult for those who are sitting in that kind of middle area. So come on down. We can see you come on. in the back there. Come on. <laughs> Somebody emailing. move for me, just so I can. Yep. Yes. Thank you, guys. Um, so welcome to our panel, uh, Accelerating the NGO Using Accelerator Models to Drive Impact in Global Development. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Savannah Miller, and I work for CARE USA. I'm the Program Officer for Innovation and Design at CARE. Um, and when we were coming up with this panel, um, I was doing some work um, in tandem with MIT and doing some research to kind of figure out what was out there in the accelerator space for NGOs, what were some of the trends, um, what were we seeing, you know, the direction in the space, um, what was happening. And as we were looking around, we saw a really huge level of diversity. Um, just a lot of different types of users, uh, a lot of different geographies, a lot of different definitions of what Accelerator meant. Um, so to get started, um, I want to just have all of our panelists introduce themselves. And we're going to start with Matu uh, from World Vision. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matu. I'm from World Vision Canada. If you don't know, World Vision is one of the oldest NGOs in the world. We have about 100 country offices, 40,000 staff, and we work across the, the board in terms of health, water, sanitation, education. Um, and we run an accelerator-like program called the Social Innovation Challenge. Uh, so the Social Innovation Challenge was really developed in response to a lot of our field offices having challenges in sectors like agriculture and education and really not knowing how to find a solution. So us as World Vision Canada developed the Social Innovation Challenge to catalyze and really capture some of the amazing technologies that come out of academic institutions in Canada and apply them to our field work in Kenya, the Philippines, Mexico. So how that works in practice is we have an open call for applicants in a certain sector area. This year it's agriculture. Um, we wait six months and solicit applications. At the end of six months, we work with a team of experts to pick 10 organizations that go through an accelerator boot camp. At the end of the accelerator, which we'll definitely get into later on, um, we pick two organizations that receive up to $50,000 worth of funding, grant funding from our end, and then we work with them for a full year to help implement their solutions with our field offices on the ground. Awesome. Michael? Great. Uh, Michael McCarg. I'm with uh, and lead the, the social ventures team at Mercy Corps, uh, global humanitarian organization. Not quite as big as World Vision, but getting up there, uh, working in uh, some of the most fragile places uh, in the world. Uh, and I'm actually going to be talking about uh, Gaza Sky Geeks, which is a tech hub and incubation, startup incubator that we have in Gaza. Uh, and I'm here representing Ryan Sturgill, who directs that program and couldn't be here. So I'm going to actually cheat and uh, read from some of his notes because uh, I don't want to screw it up. I've been to Gaza a couple of times and visiting. It's just a tremendous space. Uh, and, and we'll obviously be talking more about it. But Gaza Sky Geeks uh, is a program of Mercy Corps and seeded actually uh, with our friends over at Google.org. Uh, and the mission is to support Gaza's growth into an internationally competitive hub for tech products and services. Um, it does that by supporting a community of startup founders, freelancers, and coders under one roof and connecting them with the investors, mentors, and infrastructure that's needed as you're uh, building out uh, a tech uh, hub and, and a startup incubator. Uh, the entire existence was premised on the fact that Gaza is isolated, cut off from the rest of the world, but actually has access to high-speed internet uh, and a tremendous level of education and engineering education in Gaza. Uh, so building off of that, they really wanted to take advantage of that uh, and build a, a sort of economic engine uh, within Gaza. So we'll, we'll be talking more about it, but it's a, it's a tremendously impressive program. Rebecca? Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Holliday I'm from CARE USA. I'm the Director of Partnerships for Innovation. I'm based here in San Francisco, but work closely with Savannah and others on a number of initiatives um, coming out of the Innovation Department at CARE. So today, talking about our accelerator, we call it a Scale by Design Accelerator. Uh, it's, it's young, um, but uh, taking advantage of actually CARE's long history and global footprint. So CARE's been around 
since just after World War II um, and with presence in over 90 countries. And, and a couple of years ago, we, we took a hard look at some of our really more impactful and, and powerful programming that um, we've seen sort of emerge and evolve over, over the decades. And when one of the trends that we noticed was it was taking a really long time for some of these important programs to take hold and even take flight and, and to, to scale across the organization to have to reach those real numbers that we were hoping to see. Um, and so we, we have designed um, a program that looks and, and, and sort of harnesses um, that, that sort of spirit of, of innovation and, and really powerful programming internally at CARE um, for a program to give a select sort of cohort of, of program staff. Uh, it's a year-long program where they participate um, in a series of, of labs um, and then that culminates also in a, in a two-week boot camp um, and we do our own sort of version of a pitch night. But the idea is to kind of bring um, um, adapting from the private sector models of accelerators um, in it with an NGO twist, um, you know, how do we take and give these, our development practitioners, our project staff, the tools and resources um, and, and sort of that mindset, mindset shift to, to think about what are those pathways to scale? How do we short circuit that, you know, a 20 year trajectory of what, what took our Village Savings and Loan Association program, how can we short circuit that so maybe it's five or 10 years? Um, and, and what are the different ways that we can bring in new approaches to partnership to do that as well? And last but not least, Stephanie. Hey, well, thank you so much, Savannah, for convening this conversation and inviting FHI 360 to be a part of it. And thank all of you for coming. I'm really excited to see this crowd here, and I see a lot of familiar faces who I know are doing quite similar work in accelerators and NGOs, so hopefully we can have a good discussion at the end of this time. So my name is Stephanie Marino Turpin. I lead our partnerships team at FHI 360. FHI 360 is a global development organization working in what we call integrated development, which includes workforce development, health, and education, all of the drivers of systemic poverty throughout the world. We work in more than 60 countries, so we're operating at a fairly large scale. And our accelerator program has its roots back in 1990, when FHI 360 created a commercial entity in clinical research, spun it off, sold it for a 20-fold return on investment, and then used that capital to endow what we called the FHI Foundation. And the FHI Foundation has filled a really important gap in our resourcing model, where we're now able to invest in ideas that are kind of pre-evidence, before we can make a compelling case to donors and really test some of those ideas to see if the possibility for scale is there. About five years ago, we created something called the Catalyst Fund, which was investing in um, ideas, products, and services that were coming out of our technical teams and our programs to really see you know, what had merit and what had that ability to scale. And now we're launching what the next version of that Catalyst Fund is, which we call FHI Ventures. FHI Ventures is an accelerator model that will be working with ideas that come internally from FHI 360, as well as enterprises that we source externally from throughout our 60 plus country offices. We're looking for companies that are at the post prototype or early revenue stage, and we'll be providing investment, mentoring, coaching, and some additional business development services. And our goal with FHI Ventures is really to find those ideas that can go to scale so that we can attract some additional private capital, provide some wraparound services, and um, hopefully help those ideas scale faster. Awesome. So as you can see, we have a, a pretty wide range of what an accelerator is defined as, right? Um, so to start us off, I kind of want to get uh, deep into what are your motivations for each of your organizations uh, to take on the challenge of an accelerator for, an, for you know, the NGO context. Um, Stephanie, I'll start with you. Um, as one of the kind of, as one of the models that we were looking at um, when CARE and MIT were doing some of this initial research, um, why do you think that we're actually seeing more accelerators based out of NGOs to begin with? Yeah. You know, what I love about this conversation is it's a really specific example of this much larger trend that we're all talking a lot about at SOCAP and in the rest of our professional lives about all of the disruptors in global development and this growing intersection space between for-profit and non-profit models. So I think we're in a really interesting period of experimentation where we're seeing NGOs adopting more commercial approaches, we're seeing for-profit businesses think more seriously about 
sustainability and social impact. And importantly, we're seeing capital coming from all across the spectrum, from grant capital to market rate investments that's funding those kinds of ideas. So I think accelerators are just one kind of example of that period of experimentation mm -hmm. that we're seeing in this sector. But I do think it holds special interest for NGOs, really for two kind of oppositional reasons. The first being that it's based in a strength and the second being that it's based in a lot of our weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. So the strength is that for the past few decades, a lot of INGOs like FHI 360 and some of the others on this panel have really named our core value proposition as capacity building or technical assistance for local change makers who sit closer to the problems we're trying to solve. Over that time, I think we've seen the face of those change makers shift a bit. They're not always civil society organizations anymore. Sometimes they're for-profit businesses, sometimes they're social enterprises, and sometimes they're organizations with a blended model. And so we want to be adaptive, we want to change with our partners, and we want to be responsive in continuing to deliver on that core value proposition of capacity development, but maybe in a different way. And then the weakness side is I think accelerators are really built to help private businesses do a few things that NGOs traditionally have not been very successful at doing. <laughs> And I would include in that list flexible design to very quickly iterate around a prototype, get customer feedback, and change your approach in an agile way. Traditionally, NGOs design, and then we implement on that design, and don't really have great feedback mechanisms to change along the way. Uh, accelerators are built to seek investment. Private capital, obviously, is a new area for a lot of NGOs. And then the third that I think is really important here is accelerators are built to help ideas scale. And that's something that I think NGOs have struggled with for a long time. So in a private sector accelerator, from the beginning, the accelerator is talking to those businesses about how are you going to reach millions more people next year or the year after. In NGOs, we might set very ambitious targets for the number of people we're going to reach. And then we just kind of run like hell after those targets, knowing that we're running towards a cliff that we're going to fall off of at the project end date without necessarily great coping mechanisms for what comes after that to extend or to grow the scale of the impact that we've created. Um, so I think we're seeing now that uh, with the scale of global development challenges we're trying to address, the ambition of the SDGs, I think we're seeing more clearly than ever that we have to get better at those things. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so, the, and I wanted to kind of talk with all of you about this question. Um, to be really simplistic about our models that we have here, uh, we have two kind of global internally facing models. So CARE Scale by Design Accelerator and FHI 360's Catalyst Fund. And then we have two more local national level models um, taking on external applicants, right? Uh, that's Mercy Corps Gaza Sky Geeks and World Vision Social Innovation Challenge. So um, why did each of you guys decide on that particular audience? And then um, what, you know, what kind of pushed you forward that, towards that focus? I think with, with, with Gaza Sky Geeks, it was very much about flipping the script in Gaza. So in Gaza, you have 80% of people benefiting from international aid, extremely isolated. People uh, generally can't uh, leave at all. Uh, but a really high level of education uh, and a desire to rebuild their economy themselves. And they have the lifeline of actual, and pretty good, sometimes better than here, internet access. So how do you take advantage of that talent, which is trapped almost you know, in an island that, you know, Gaza is no bigger than, you know, much bigger than Manhattan, uh, and, and kind of flip the script on what that is. And so, you know, what Gaza Sky Geeks has really been trying to build is a community. So, you know, at different times, they began by doing some tech training and a more traditional uh, development approach, then saw the opportunity to actually accelerate some early startup businesses. Uh, and what you realize over time is that actually you have to build the whole community. You have to have a coding academy. You have to have freelancers who have trained and ability to, to get some different uh, work that way. Some of them can eventually form businesses uh, in the startups. Uh, there's seven now uh, actually pitching uh, in Jordan and Turkey that have come out of the, the Gaza Sky Geeks Accelerator. So again, but it's, it's about changing that narrative, uh, and so we're very much focused on uh, those startups and those people. And the, and the space itself, I mean, it's like walking into uh, a Google startup space when you go into to Gaza and the Gaza Sky Geeks, uh, and it's tremendously inclusive. About 50% of uh, the people coming through are women, which is uh, a little bit more of a rarity in the Middle East, so it's really impressive. 
So we, um, quite honestly, before we launched our social innovation challenge, tried to do this internally. We spent a full year thinking about how World Vision can leverage its strengths internally to develop social enterprises. We failed. Um, none of the social enterprises got off the ground, and um, there was wasted resources, and we just didn't have the capacity. So our automatic reaction to that is, if we can't do it internally, how can we look externally and leverage some of the technologies that are really coming out of these academic institutions, out of these social enterprises, um, and create a place where we can use them to help the, the work that we're trying to do. So our accelerator really came from a place of failure and realizing our core capacity is not to build new companies and to build new technologies, it's to help them implement in the ways that we work. Yeah, sometimes pivot, pivot, pivot exactly. equals so, some success. Silicon Valley, it's not failure, it's learning. <laughs> so just, to, just to kind of pile on there, so putting on my social ventures hat at Mercy Corps, we also have an externally facing social venture fund investing in early stage mm. startup businesses. But it's built off of when I first came, we, the team emerged uh, a couple of years back at Mercy Corps, we focused on internally and said, yeah. all right, we have this great platform, uh, we know the problems on the ground, Let's you know, take some of our internal entrepreneurs, uh, start, get startup businesses, and spin them out. I mean, how hard can that be? <laughs> well, we actually did know the problems really deeply, uh, but we didn't have, and we didn't have the incentive structure mm -hmm. to, for in entrepreneurs to thrive internally. So we said, from the social venture side, let's work with entrepreneurs that are working right, right alongside us and look at that platform, which all of our NGOs have, as an asset to those entrepreneurs. And so we see it as both a way to help accelerate those entrepreneurs, but also as a learning laboratory. These entrepreneurs and these businesses that we're investing in can do things that at an NGO we can't do. Yeah. So that's, that's very much how we landed on. And I would say I love the word learning, but I think in general, NGOs are afraid of the word failure and we don't embrace it positively enough. So I, I love hearing you guys say that, but I will just outright and say we failed and we're learning from it and that's something because we aren't flexible enough and can't iterate fast enough, we haven't really embraced that culture of failure yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Rebecca, I, I would love to uh, hear from you about because Scale by Design Accelerator is still we're you know we're only in our second year, but yeah. we're currently trying to do what World Vision kind of failed at. So how how are we doing? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, um, you know, I think again it's sort of an expansive definition of of accelerator and and also. You know, while some of the participants may see their pathway to scale or their their sort of um, you know plan for sustainability to spin off, but I think in a lot of other cases, you know, we're not we're not saying that that needs to be the path they go on. And I think if you take that pressure off, that you don't have to become a business, um, and that that you maybe look you know help them you know find ways to partner with local government or other NGOs, or uh, you were on a panel yesterday where they were saying, you know, scaling could be someone else adopting your model. And sure, that doesn't solve your sustainability problem, but if we're talking about a broader mission and broader goals, that is success, right? Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we're still testing this out, and I think we're, we're the first to admit that we're continuing to tweak, and I'll have a chance to say a little bit more about what we're thinking about for next year, right? Um, but, but certainly I think we still believe that there is a viable internal opportunity to, to provide some new resources, some new thinking um, for our own staff. And, and, and so far, certainly we've seen um, a lot of interest. We had a lot of applications from all over the world again this year. Um, and, and the team seemed to be responding. But, but yes, I mean, we, you know, we need to come back here in a couple years and say, well, where are we on that, those pathways to scale? And, and, and I think the jury's still out on that. And we're still fighting that good fight too at FHI 360 of helping those internal ideas scale, whether through for-profit businesses or philanthropic funding. We have this Catalyst Fund, which last year I believe received over 100 applications for funding internally, which were fairly high quality applications that I think were really research-based. That commercialization, of course, is the difficult part. And we have launched two commercial entities, both with successful exits. So we know that pathway is possible, but it's certainly a challenging one. And I think, uh, Mike, you hit the nail on the head there with getting the incentive structure right, I think is a very challenging thing to do within an international nonprofit governance structure. Yeah, so, we, so we've kind of touched on the like nimbleness of the idea of an accelerator and maybe the slightly less nimbleness of the uh, traditional NGO structure. So I wanted to kind of dive into that. Um, and look at what the compatibility really is 
for these kind of accelerator models and you know traditional NGO development programming. Um, so Rebecca, I wanted to start with you. Um, how does the Scale by Design Accelerator interact and like affect the rest of CARE's core grant-funded business? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, I'd say we're we're still on that learning journey, um, but I think it's you know the the core accelerator team is extremely small, um, and so to be successful, you have to find internal partners and internal champions, um, whether it's you know the the technical staff um, on the different areas that Care focuses on in terms of its programming, to the Care office country directors, etc. Um, so we're um, you know, but we, we have seen some, some interesting ways of uptake, right? So um, some of our uh, alumni from cohort one um, that participated in, in the year-long program and then have graduated, we, we're seeing them sort of branch out and share some of the learnings and sort of be almost mentors or advisors to other care country offices. So, so that it's not just, if only if you are in, you get accepted to the program, do you get to access the resources. Um, and, and I mentioned this earlier, but we're, we're looking at the design for the next cohort. So we start in May. It's a May to May cycle. So we're in the midst of cohort two, but having to think about what does next year look like. And we, um, it looks like we're going to be partnering with CARES Women's Economic Empowerment and Food and Nutrition and Security teams. So, so kind of honing in a little bit more in terms of a thematic focus, um, but also then bringing those um, program staff into the process a little bit more because the idea, you know, it, it, again, you don't want this to stop after a year. What, what is the what is the baton handoff? If if you're learning about really interesting, um, you know, programming opportunities in in Ghana that could be extremely relevant in, you know, in Bangladesh, what what is that what does that connectivity look like? And and how do we work with our our program staff to to help kind of disseminate that across the organization? And then the last point I'd make on that, we're also just the curriculum itself that we've developed and we continue to tweak and refine because it's a, definitely a moving target in terms of what's the right tools and, and materials for our teams. But, you know, again, we have these labs that we've created, but then um, our Care Philippines country office raised its hand and said, hey, we're starting up these humanitarian innovation hubs and we'd actually like to adapt the Scale by Design curriculum to start um, our own sort of uh, work with local Filipino um, civil society organizations around humanitarian innovation. And so we said, great, and you know, and we're working with them to adapt it, but it's, it's a great way that we're seeing that it doesn't just sit in the silo of this accelerator program. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Michael and Matthew, I have, I have a question for you guys. How is your accelerator funded? Funding is the internal problem of the, <laughs> the NGO. Um, we are very lucky at World Vision Canada to have a supportive internal innovation program. So um, we actually won something like a Shark's Tank or a Dragon Den internally at World Vision and got $50,000 worth of seed funding to launch the first version of the Social Innovation Challenge. What we didn't expect to happen was during the second challenge, um, we had a lot of high net worth donors come to us who have an entrepreneurial background and say, how can we participate? How can we fund this, this program? Um, and, th and the second iteration of it was in energy. So we had two high net worth donors, one that was a, a major CEO of a solar manufacturing company, and one was a, a major CEO of a hydrogen manufacturing company, energy company. And they came to us and said, we'll fund the prize. We're really interested in looking at the technologies that come out of it and potentially um, working with them. Um, so along with that funding, I think this is where we really got them to participate, was they were a judge within the Accelerator Pitch Day. They worked with the teams in the Accelerator, mentored them, provided technology and in contextual support, and really have had really positive feedback on their experience with the Social Innovation Challenge. So building on that model for us in the future, as we launch more challenges, or one this year is agriculture, we go back to our donor base, we go back to our high net worth um, philanthropy advisors and ask them who's working in agriculture, what major technology companies do we have in our donor base, do we see as potential opportunities, and are they interested in funding this? Yeah, yeah I think we've thrown everything at Gaza Sky Geek. So it started <laughs> with you know, great partners like uh, Google.org that you know, wanted to raise awareness around tech uh, and entrepreneurship in Gaza, so we brought on corporate partners, uh, some foundations. Uh, most recently, we had a crowdfunding campaign uh, that was very successful, uh, and both successful in um, 
that raised a few hundred thousand dollars, but also brought a tremendous number of people uh, into that network, which mm -hmm. become mentors uh, for mm -hmm. a lot of the entrepreneurs uh, and techies that are going through. I mean, Gaza Sky Geeks and Mercy Corps have had uh, a tremendous record of bringing people across the border as mentors. Uh, if you can imagine, the very few people uh, can leave Gaza. So bringing in folks with that Silicon Valley background and, and tech hubs coming in and mentoring uh, those you know, you know, early stage businesses, the, the, the techies has been just tremendous. So that crowdfunding campaign was uh, really both fundraising and sort of awareness. Um, and now we actually have the, the Dutch government is coming in now that we they can really see a bigger picture of that ecosystem. So, you know, a coding academy, the freelancing academy that we have, all those pieces coming together, we're seeing some larger partners come on board and we're hoping to continue to build. And there's the possibility, and I think the team, once they can get uh, Gaza Sky Geek settled, maybe taking the Sky Geeks model to some other tough spots. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. Um, and I, I had this, this question with Rebecca, you in mind, um, but really I would love any of you to answer it. Um, so what limitations have you seen with running a program model taken from the private sector and translating it over to the specific NGO development environment? Yeah, so I, th three quick things on that. Yeah. I could go on forever probably. <laughs> uh, and I, I come from the private sector, so I'm new to the nonprofit sector too. Um, but so I think, I mean, a few things. So I'm on the innovation team at CARE, and, and we're actually doing a lot of new exciting things, and, and that's, that's great. Um, you know, we've got our impact investing arm. We've got a new consulting model that we're experimenting with, um, you know, a whole sort of R&D unit that we're building. Um, but I think there's a risk there that, that's, you know, people uh, who've been at CARE for, for decades maybe may see it as like, oh, just, oh, that's the innovation team doing their, like, new thing, or, oh, that accelerator is just a side project. Um, and so we're still, you know, we really have to work hard, you know, to build those internal partnerships and to say that, no, we're, we're, we're here, we're here to stay and, and for, for really important reasons. Um, and, you know, we've talked about another theme I find, I hear, at, you know, at, at this conference is around, you know, the sort of future of the international NGO and the, the kind of critical need to transform the operating model. So. Um, also just, I mean, you know, you can't just take the curriculum from a private sector focused accelerator that, you know, maybe work, is used to working with entrepreneurs and just, you know, hand it off to project staff within CARE. Again, this is for our internal model, internally focused model. Um, you know, we, again, we, it's a huge mindset shift. So we've had to work really hard to adapt the materials and we're on our third, even sometimes fourth iterations of a module to see like, okay, what does that uptake? Um, and we you know we're doing some of this work, um, this, these materials doing it remotely over, over webinars and then, you know, we, we have to translate the materials into a number of different languages. So that, you know, that's tricky. And I'm not saying that other, the, the private sector doesn't have to deal with that, but I think for us to be, to think about the, the, the baseline that we're working with, which is people who've generally been working in the NGO space in the development, you know, in the development world for, for most of their careers. Um, and then, look, working within a large organization is just tough, right? I mean, and I, I mean, I came from a large multinational corporation and before that the U.S. government, so I like to say I have like a black belt in bureaucracy, you know. <laughs> you can get around it, but, but, you know, just our procurement systems and anything to, to just quickly change. And if we want to work with a new partner, you know, like, you know, a, a new consultant maybe to help us design something and they're not on our approved vendor list, like, God forbid, how long does it take to get them added to our vendor list or, you know. Right? I'm probably going to Do we work here. for the same organization? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Um, but we have tremendous, tremendous support from our leadership, and we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm from, from our teams on the ground, and that's what matters. And so, you know, for those of us, you know, day to day, kind of, we can, we can plow through the bureaucracy to make sure that we can still keep this going for the, for the organization. Okay. Yeah. Any other uh, dirty laundry we want to air? <laughs> I thought that was well said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just one of the, the big things I've noticed really recently is language. Um, the language of Silicon Valley, startup culture, accelerators, is not pervasive in the development sector and especially within the staff that work yeah. in Canada and the USA, but more so on the ground in, in the countries that we work in. So we've very intentionally positioned our model as a challenge and as a competition in entrepreneurship to get away from some of the language that someone sees for the first time and is very, very frightened of working in that space because they've been working with the NGO for 20 years and, and are afraid of what's going to happen as the NGO evolves. Yeah. 
So before we get into some uh, questions from you all in the audience, which get them, get them going in your heads, um, I wanted to ask you, Stephanie, um, what kind of part, how have partnerships played a part in your work and, and what kind of area, what areas do you see new types of collaboration happening? Yes, I love that question. Because I think the type of work that we're trying to do with an NGO, it's so much easier and I think ultimately more successful when we work in partnership with yeah. actors who look different than we do. So I think about the partnerships that we need in kind of two buckets. The first is local partners. So for all of us, we work for NGOs that are based in the US and Canada. A lot of the places we're trying to accelerate companies are not in the US and Canada. And so we need to be really conscious of what's already happening in the entrepreneurial ecosystems in those countries and make sure that we're really linked in with the entrepreneurs, the investors, the existing accelerators and incubators, and all of the business development services that already exist in that country so that the work that we're doing is additive and not duplicative. Luckily, that's very similar to a lot of the partnership work that our organizations are used to doing. So I think we're well prepared for that task. Uh, maybe the more challenging bucket for partnerships is partnerships with private sector actors. Mm -hmm. And for those partnerships, I think we have a lot of work to do to get better at really listening well, speaking each other's language, and really honestly communicating the value that we each bring. So when I look at the assets that FHI 360 has, and I think this is shared with many other INGOs, I think of a really deep understanding of the problems that we're trying to solve and best practice in those areas of social change. I think about networks and knowledge about how to operate in many of these emerging markets. And I think of an understanding of grant and philanthropic capital and how to blend that with private capital. Our growth edge is return-seeking investment. When you look at private sector accelerators and investors and you think about their assets and their weaknesses, they're really inverted. And so for a partnerships person, that's really exciting to me because it means that there's really fertile ground for some mutually beneficial partnerships to spring up there. I would be so excited to see a for-profit accelerator that's really successful at scaling businesses to partner with an NGO where they continue to provide their business development services and their connection to investors, and the NGO provides some targeted advice about the impact model and best practice in global development. I think that could be a really cool type of partnership that I'd love to see more of. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so, I think maybe we have a mic man or woman somewhere? Yep, I think we have. Yay, so if, if uh, we want to just open it up to questions, we'd love that. Uh, we want we really wanted this panel to be super interactive, and we know there are probably lots of fun questions brewing, so. Be provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. My name's Chris Johnson from Choice Humanitarian. Thanks for this discussion. Um, I'm interested in any thoughts or um, strategies that you guys are aware of or thinking about in terms of partnering with small grassroots NGOs who are a lot more nimble, maybe a lot more innovative and progressive and in touch with those communities who have innovators, or as an NGO, small NGO wanting to be an innovator in terms of um, bringing in revenue models to sustain the NGO itself, as well as the populations they serve in partnership, but not having the capital or access to the markets that would get behind that in terms of accelerator labs training. You guys talked about internal, and you talk about access to the entrepreneurs on the ground, but how can the grassroots NGOs play a space in uh, addressing their own financial needs in innovation as well as being uh, a good partner of accessing and achieving the goals that you guys have set up? Yeah, if I can take that real quick. Um, so, I, I, I was remiss when I said we are, an, an, we are an internal, primarily internally focused model, but for this year we're experimenting and op we've opened it up 
to a couple of our peer NGOs. So we have a, a team from World Wildlife Fund and a team from Habitat for Humanity participating. And it's, it's sort of, t it's a, we're testing a hypothesis that this is relevant for other NGOs. And I think our dream, our dream one day is that it's, it's absolutely not about care staff, but it's, it's a broader you know, model for the NGO community. Um, and, and whether it's run out of care or it's run by another sort of umbrella organization, you know, who knows? But, um, but I think that, and to make it available for those grassroots organizations w would be, I think, really powerful. And I, I think we need to get out of a sort of headquarters-centric mindset. You know, my, my dream for, and if, you know, funding permitting one day, you know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, the team doesn't sit out of Atlanta to run the program, but we, you know, can decentralize it and have either, whether it's a country-level accelerator or at the very least regional-level accelerators, which I think would then also really bolster some of the partnership opportunities. So, you know, we sometimes are scratching our heads. How do we get a mentor who sits maybe in San Francisco to advise a team in Vietnam? And it's like, no, forget it. Where are the mentors in Vietnam that are, you know, that can be really powerful? Yeah. Yeah, totally agree with that. I would just add some compassion that I think the same disruptors that big INGOs fa are facing are the same disruptors that small NGOs are facing, but they have a little bit less cushion for that innovation. The flip side is that smaller NGOs can be a lot more nimble and more innovative, so I would expect to see a lot of experimentation with new forms coming out of smaller NGOs that hopefully we can learn from as well. And I'd give a shout out to groups like Village Capital, which took its sort of acceleration model and created uh, Vilcap communities and said, okay, well, how can we teach this methodology to kind of all comers? And they convened a, a whole set of uh, different communi Vilcap communities that learned the curriculum, they shared it, uh, and they were testing it out in different. So that type of replication, I mean, that's scale. Uh, and and they, they did a, a good job of getting a lot of things off the ground, so. Great. Right there. Is this on? There we go. Um, I'm Mike Shanley. I'm with Connected. We're a USAID advisory firm that help clients work with USAID. Do you guys see, given the restrictions with a lot of bilateral and multilateral donors, that that could be a good funding source for this type of activity? Or is this going to be something that's going to have to come from more private foundations and high net worth individuals? Yeah, one, one thing, uh, I won't name the funder, but it's a bilateral and it's not USAID that I recently saw where it was coming down from, so they wanted to support uh, tech hubs in the Maghreb and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. It was very much driven from the funder's point of view of what those communities needed. And you read through the RFP and our teams put together, but it wasn't, you know, put together a proposal, but it wasn't built on what I think likely the entrepreneurs would have wanted in those markets. So you have that sort of bad game of telephone where the funder tells the, the implementing agency what to be done and then all of a sudden the entrepreneur, you're creating services that aren't even needed. Uh, and you know, potentially the funds aren't even flowing down to those more grassroots organizations that are doing the work. So I think we have to get it right and communicate up from the entrepreneur or whomever you're working with to say, here's what's, what's likely needed. It's going to have to be iterated uh, and it's going to have to be some flexible kind of funding. And that's you know, what we have with Gaza Sky Geeks, with the Dutch coming in, uh, is giving that flexibility to sort of iterate. Uh, but again, you know, it's going to be the, there's interesting teams, Global Development Lab at USAID and others get it. And so we'll, we'll see how it plays out over time. Yeah, from our end, um like Rebecca said, we're still learning. This is still a learning process for us, and we haven't quite figured out what is the best way to do it. And I think what we find from high net worth individuals and foundations is that they're more willing to come along with us in that learning process and take yeah. those risks. Yeah. When we reach out to some of the, the government agencies and the bilateral organizations, they often want a tried and tested model, which our accelerator isn't. So. I think as it grows and as we kind of ferment some of these, um, cement some of these processes, we could go to bilateral um, organizations, but um, the flexibility and the risk -taking, taking capacity from foundations and, and high net worth is, is really what we're after right now. Yeah, I would agree with that, but I do think there's an opportunity for scale with USAID that a lot of private foundations just frankly aren't able to match. So the vast majority of FHI 360's funding comes from USAID, including some of our most innovative work they fund our work in last mile connectivity for some emerging markets where we would really love to see a guy, Gaza Sky Geeks at some point, but the internet just isn't there yet. Um, so I think USAID can be an important partner in this. I think it's just important to make sure that it's coupled with some more flexible funding so that you're able to really have the scale, but also the more agile partners who can come in a little faster, but probably at smaller ticket sizes. 
And it's, I think it's the scale of some of those USAID grants that allows, I mean, frankly, our social development team is funded off the core funding that comes off of those large grants. So our ability to do that work is based upon the fact that we, we have uh, these large partners. And so you, you start to carve out some of that to, to work on uh, some interesting right, great. projects. I think we had somebody right there. Hello? Oh, perfect. Uh, my name is Marcia. I work for PSI. I'm interested for those organizations that are, which is a large health NGO, for those who don't know us, probably many here. Um, for those who are looking at supporting enterprises outside of your own enterprises, uh, is there, what's the motivation for that? Is it purely alt altruistic? Is there a profit motivation? And how do you structure those deals? Yeah, I would argue, <laughs> and I think th this point was made by Marilia yesterday, uh, this is not going to make money for, this is not revenue. Uh, so to don't bet on entrepreneurs that way. When I, when I put on my sort of social ventures app for Mercy Corps, uh, it's very much that learning laboratory. What can, we, what can those early stage enterprises that are innovating around an alternative credit scoring algorithm for smallholder farmers or a different type of distribution model, what can we learn from that and potentially carry that into some of our other programs? And what we, what we want to bet on, it's also leverage. I mean, we have about a 15 to 1 leverage ratio over the money that we put into those uh, social enterprises and the, co the kind of co-investment and follow-on financing that they've received. So it's, it's great leverage. Um, so that, yeah. Yeah, our primary motivation is absolutely impact too. I don't think this is going to be a huge revenue driver for FHI 360. But I do think an exciting differentiator about this is that it won't lose 100% of the money we put into it, which is our current operating model when you take a grant, 100% loss, impact creation, but 100% financial loss. Here, you know, any cost recovery and hopefully sustainability is you know, a vast improvement in terms of recycling the amount of resources that we have to continue scaling impact over time. And if the, if the enterprises work, they're, you know, this word is overused, but they're sustainable. They grow, the engine is their own revenue and their own growth and they, they move beyond it and hopefully get to scale. So I think that's the, the bet. Yeah, cost recovery, I, I mean, I, I think is a huge one for, a huge opportunity for a lot of these models. Um, maybe not totally in the green, but if you can get part of the way there, for a lot of us in our sector, that's, that's, that's huge. <laughs> Where, who else do we have? Great. Dave Lair from Holt Business School. And I actually built many of the things in the social innovations at Mercy Corps that Michael and his team took apart. <laughs> I was so like, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate learning from the, the more current. When it came to incentives, I saw you guys all shake your heads like, oh, yeah, incentives. Can you talk a little bit about what those incentives are and how they kind of play out in organizations that are supposed to sort of try to treat everybody equally. Sorry, incentives to? Incentives to support the types of investment. So looking externally instead of internally, or even internally, how you're motivating and incentivizing people. So I can tell you from our internal um, failure is that we didn't have the right incentives because um, we didn't have any performance metrics or time set aside or compensation tied to, you, here's your innovation idea, now run with it and um, create a scalable enterprise. We had one person who actually had some time backfilled within the organization. He was the most successful because there was some time and incentives associated with his idea. Um, from from our, our model right now, um, I, I don't think the incentives are needed because our I'm situated within our impact investing and innovation team. This is our mission as a, a five-person team to find new ways to explore development, work with accelerators. So really for us, the big change was spinning this out, creating it into a new team, and putting performance metrics um, reporting around our ability to innovate and, and use accelerator models. We found a good way to piss off country directors was to, to, uh, to offer this, you know, ability to, you know, people were starting their own enterprises, but these were the highest performers on the big grants that we had in a place like Uganda, and all of a sudden they were working on a startup and not putting their time into those programs. So I think we, you know, for us, for Mercy Corps, it was about, okay, let's spin this out, let's work with entrepreneurs that are external. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of mechanisms, and, and obviously you guys are are working on them to, to innovate internally and, and get those mechanisms right. But we found for launching for-profit enterprises, we were gonna look external. Yeah, and I would just say we're, 
we're, we're very much working on it still. Um, you know, we, we have a small prize, you know, it's sort of like a, a little boost of some grant funding that we, we give a, a subset of the teams, um, but, but it's, it's not enough for them to go running off for, for several years on their own. And so, so in, but in some ways, maybe that's okay, right? So it, it's also building out um, a broader ecosystem of support across the organization um, and, and working uh, in many ways with our, with our partnerships teams, our regional partnership directors, to think about what are the different ways that are, you know, how can we help, um, I think, it, it, like expand the aperture of what it, you know, what it means to, like what would be a next step and what types of other private sector or, or other organizations could, could our teams think about working with. Um, you know, some of our teams are doing some really cool work in education, and so I've been in talks with Coursera um, here in Silicon Valley to think, okay, well, that they might not think that that's an opportunity, but actually it, it is really powerful. Um, and then, you know, the other piece that we admittedly really need to kind of double down on now that we're in our second year is what does alumni support look like? So what is the incentive to to go through a program that where you know it doesn't just stop at the end of that year? Um, and we, we've got someone coming on board to really focus in on that. Um, and and in, in the cases of those those programs that may spin off into or try to spin off into social enterprises, what, what does that dedicated kind of internal resourcing and, and, and kind of mentorship look like? But uh, we're very much I feel like I'm a broken record here, still on that learning journey. <laughs> well, Samantha, great. Greetings, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, great dialogue and discussion. I'm Linda Barnes with Bloodworks. Our mission is innovation in blood and blood transfusion to save lives. I had a question about intellectual property, and as it relates to entrepreneurial pursuit, and uh, moving innovations out into a global arena, often I see restrictions being placed or um, intellectual property discussions in contracts related to perpetu perpetual royalty-free access to license and the ability to sub-license the entrepreneur's product to others. I was curious if you've ex how you've overcome that and what experience you've had with respect to intellectual property. Who wants to tackle this one? <laughs> this is a hard one. Um, this may not be a direct answer to your question, but I do think for grant-funded organizations, intellectual property is a really tricky question because oftentimes the donor who's funded your, your grant, which fueled the work that you did, either owns the intellectual property or requires that you have like open source common license, um, which makes it more difficult to commercialize. So this is something that, to USAID's credit, they're really thinking carefully about, and I'm hopeful that we might have some clearer guidance from them that gives us a little more space to innovate, at least for those innovations that were funded out of USAID work. But I think for grant-funded organizations, IP is a sticky issue that we at least have to navigate on a case-by-case -case basis with our legal team. Yeah, okay. I think we're just gonna take two more questions, so we'll have you first. Um, hi, my name is Erin. I work for UNICEF USA. I was just wondering, what are some of the impact metrics that your um, programs kind of tie to and are held accountable for? And for shorter term programs, do you track or, or look to track outcomes after the um, certain investments or programs have left the program? So if an accelerated program is on a one year term, once that thing that you're accelerating has left, are you tracking their longer term success? Um, so the way that we do it at World Vision is that um, our first challenge was around health and, and wash, and we aligned our impact metrics to what our grants team use to track their overall portfolio of, of, of health and wash. Um, they've been doing it for, for tens of years, decades, of, decades now, and they know what they're looking for. So the way that we work with our enterprises is that we ask for three metrics, um, very generic metrics. Um, that these enterprises can report on all across the board if they're in the health program. And then we work with them to get impact metrics and outcome metrics on a case-by-case -case base basis because every enterprise is really different. So um, it's one of the really challenging things for us is because there are no two similar enterprises entering our accelerator program, we can't ask them all to use the same 10 metrics. So finding that flexibility has been a, a key learning for us. We have from the, again, from the social ventures perspective, 
Um, that's the role that Mercy Corps can help play with these impact entrepreneurs. They're for-profit businesses, but we know how to do monitoring and evaluation of impact, and we can help them sort of both define that impact, define the metrics, and we generally do that in the due diligence phase before we invest, and then we track those met metrics, and we can go into a kind of breadth, depth, and reach. So we get very specific about the metrics that we're tracking with them and help them sort of define that, and hopefully very much related to their business metrics so that it's natural for them to track these things. So if you know uh, a given agent has an increased revenue of this much, uh, you're going to be able to hold on to that agent. So that, that's on the social venture side. I would say from the Gaza Sky Geeks, there's a lot of sort of um, output sort of level. So how many people went through the coding academy? How many people uh, are on the freelancing training platform? How many startups have been accelerated? Uh, but I would caution that in, in Gaza Sky Geek's case, that's a community that you're building over time. So, I, you know, yes, you want that, that flowing through, and then when you get these larger grants, that's what they want to be tracking. But I think there's something to be said for that which is not unmeasurable, but it's harder to measure mm -hmm. in creating a community and a tech hub in Gaza and how that can play out over time. So I think there's, there's an argument there and a narrative that we can uh, work on. Yeah. Um, we're this has been a tough one for us, and, and actually, and frankly, part of it has been about resourcing it. So we, we you know, didn't have a budget to hire a full-time M&E person for, to look at our accelerator, the program writ large, and then to really carefully track each of, each of the, the teams in both cohort one and cohort two. So uh, admittedly, we're paying, playing a little bit of catch-up right now on that front, um, but also butting up against, and, and Matthew, you mentioned this, the challenges of you know, within our, we, we, we pride our program in its diversity in terms of the geographic spread and the sort of sectoral or thematic, um, you know, differences, but that makes it very difficult to then, you know, to not only roll anything up yeah. into, you know, a, some broader indicators, but then also for, you know, uh, we, you know, we brought in someone to help with, with some of the initial sort of out, um, outcome harvesting work that we did out of cohort one, and, and they, they were having a very difficult time because the teams were so different. Um, and then we've also had some attrition. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, a couple of our teams, um, they, you know, they didn't end up getting follow-on grant funding, and so the program isn't isn't going on. And and so yes, I mean, I think that is an indicator in and of itself that we, you know, can take some degree of ownership over. Um, but there's also just turn up staff turnover in, in our sector that I think is is a reality um, that that we're also kind of grappling with. So so we're. Um, we're, we're kind of figuring this out, and I think it's a space that probably amongst ourselves can probably learn learn from each other a little bit more and, and find you know find out um, what what is working and, and why and you know, start adapting. Great, and do we have one more question? Great. Uh, hi there, my name is Sandra Butler, and I work for the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, we also, we work with entrepreneurs in low-resource settings and also offer acceleration support. But my question is, we are a non-traditional team in the four walls of a hospital, and I know from my experience now and my career path navigating from a USAID-funded role initially to trying to find private sector dollars in my world is global health, but more generally development, is a really tough path to, fo to follow. Um, and often there are traditionalists that as soon as you talk about money in the development world, you've lost mission, you're no longer doing good, whether it's advocating for your own salary so that you're not living in this kind of martyrdom world that you should do this for free, or talking about profit or return on investment. So I'm just curious as kind of more traditional actors where you are, in the development space, what sort of challenges you've had internally to sensitize your own colleagues to the type of work that you're all doing and, and trying to incorporate into a more traditional development space? That's a great mm -hmm. question. What do you guys? I'd, no, I'd, I'd like to think that um, I'm basically going to be fired every day. <laughs> so if 50% of the organization is against what we're doing, that's probably a good indicator we're going on the right path. And it's, it has been hard. It's hard to absorb uh, for, you know, again, wearing the sort of social ventures hat, this type of work. Wait, we're working with for-profit entrepreneurs. We're, invent we're actually taking an equity stake. We're going to own a piece of their company. Like, isn't that, you know, how could we possibly do that? But as you sensitize them and say, okay, take off your non-profit, your for-profit hat, what are these people doing? They're, they're innovating on certain ideas. They have a certain model that's going to help carry them forward. Uh, we want to bet on them, and this is the proper way to do it. The grant doesn't work in this particular case. A for-profit investment does. So you, you sensitize and have that conversation over and over, and it helps it refine. I mean, it's, it's good to also 
put pressure on our team to say, all right, can we defend this type of approach? You know, we, this is still an ongoing experiment for Mercy Corps. We, we, we've done 10 investments over the last two years, uh, but are we finding that the entrepreneurs benefit from the linkage to the platform? And we're starting to see that really well. But again, it, it just takes time at the board level, and you have to get those conversations right too. Again, not a revenue generation tool for it, not, not the new way that INGOs are going to work and everything's gonna be impact investment. Uh, clarify what this tool is and kind of go forward that way. For us, it's really been uh, bringing whoever we need internally and, and want to work with on much earlier in the process. Um, so now, we launched, launched our agricultural challenge this year. We brought um, our country directors in Kenya, Philippines, and Mexico, started talking to them in January of last year, and we launched the, the challenge last, this September. Um, so getting them involved in the process and giving the, letting their ideas kind of also accumulate within, within the accelerator and, and providing them an opportunity to give their voices in, has really been a, a big learning for us because, quite frankly, without the support of the country directors, we can't do any of the work that we're doing. So um, really making sure they have a voice in the process is contributing to, to our success within that, that endeavor. Yeah, I mean, I would echo the, the country director or country office level buy-in is critical. Um, when our, uh, when CARE's chief innovation officer came on board about a year and a half ago, she started kind of, you know, talking to folks at the headquarters level and, and certainly faced, a, whether it was a quizzical look or just flat out, like, resistance to what she was talking about. And then she said, forget it, and she left town. And she practically traveled for an entire year and really spent the time with, with frankly, the people that matter most, our, our country office staff. And, and I think there she validated why we exist and why it's important. And, and that's continued to be our North Star is actually away from the big orange box in Atlanta. So I think it's being, it, it's, you want to obviously play nice in the sandbox and, 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 in, and get the people, you know, get those critical folks on board early on, but also to, to kind of bear in mind that, you know, you don't have to have the entire organization on board. There's going to be some level of discomfort, and that's probably a good sign. And to, to remember who, who at the end of the day within your organization are the most critical kind of target audience and, and sort of customers in that yeah, regard. find your first adopters, find those champions. Yeah. It only has to be a handful, yeah. and then mm -hmm. you can really kind of... And I would just add that, you know, some of the opposition that I've experienced has come from kind of binary thinking of if we take this route, then it means we don't care about our traditional grant-funded business and we won't continue to work in that way. I don't think that's true, and I think we can move beyond that question of is it a burning platform, is it not a burning platform, will the aid check stop coming next year or 50 years from now? I think all my message is, is that this is another way to create impact. And if we can do something that also creates impact in an agile, sustainable way, while continuing to have a flourishing core business, fabulous. And then we'll kind of see how things evolve over the next few years, because frankly, none of us really know. Yeah. So thank you all for your really fabulous questions uh, today. I want to kind of end our panel with some key learning. So, you know, we only have about a minute and a half left, but if you could each give your key learnings that you've learned over the last couple years um, as you're kind of on this accelerator journey, uh, and, you know, what, what, what can we share? I would just echo the last conversation we had. The biggest key learning for us is building buy-in and, and building trust with the organization that we work in. It is a new model, and making sure that they're on board and supporting us in every way is, is key to success. Uh, I think for us, just get started. Uh, I think you know the, these. You can have conversations with your board, with staff, or, and it can go on for years. And there, there's no sort of urgency. Uh, I think what I, I love about the you know our, we have a small team within Mercy Corps, and Mercy Corps has an environment that said, okay, we're we're not going to give you a lot of resources, but go out there and just do it. And and we got started, and we learned from that doing. Uh, so I'd say just kind of get started. Yeah, I, I think one learning is that it's like to be transparent um, early and often about about both the successes, but also the challenges and failures. Um, so we're out there sharing our materials with other NGOs and, and other folks, and not saying that it's perfect, right? But we, I think that's part of that learning process that we want to kind of make it more open and permeable. I think a key lesson for me is that the right types of partnerships are really game changing. So I would say be really proud of the value that your organization brings to this space and humble 
about what you don't yet know and look for those mutually beneficial partnerships that can help us all go a little faster. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out uh, to our panel, and uh, we'll yield the floor to, to the next group. Thank you, guys. Thank you.